on camera. Okay. Um, good afternoon. This is Kerry King, uh, and I am with the uh, interview team from the Atlanta History Center. We're also here on behalf of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., to conduct your interview today. And we are here today with Harry J. Cohn, K-O-N-E, and it is December 19th, 2018, and we are in Marietta, Georgia. Mr. Cohn, thank you for allowing us to come and interview you today, and it's a pleasure to meet you and an honor, I might add. Mm. Thank you very much for coming. Okay. Very happy to be here. All right. Um, I understand you were in the Marine Corps in World War II. Correct. All right. And if you wouldn't mind, why don't you start by giving us a little bit of your background growing up, where you grew up, and where you graduated high school, and so forth. I was born in Baltimore, Maryland in 1920. And uh, I lived there until I moved to Milwaukee way back in 19, what was it? It was so long ago, I can't even remember. In 1930, I guess. Uh, uh, but I did enjoy Baltimore while I lived there, and uh, I was very impressed because uh, we had to ride streetcars all the time. And I think a streetcar used to cost us about 10 cents, and we'd get a transfer to another streetcar outside of where, the, uh, where we lived and wanted to go. But to my big remembrance about being in uh, Baltimore that there were no public stores like Kroger's or Publix, and we had to go to a big shopping center called the Lexington Market. And I always remember this because my dad loved a certain type of cheese, and it was called Limburger cheese. And uh, I would be with my mother, and we'd be shopping for this cheese, and she'd buy, I don't know how many pounds of this, but they used to wrap it in newspaper. And uh, then we'd, uh, after we finished our shopping, we could look for a streetcar to go back home. And I always wondered why people would not sit next to us. <laughs> but if you know anything about Limburger cheese, you would know. And uh, I never liked it, and I could never get it past my navel. <laughs> try to eat that stuff, but uh, they loved it, and so that was the main thing. That was my big uh, remembrance about the Lexington Market and the streetcars. But we, uh, we used to enjoy the streetcar uh, because it wasn't too far from our house. We could walk about a half a block and there was the streetcar. So uh, I went to uh, uh, high school in Baltimore uh, Mount St. Joseph High School, and I uh, spent four years there, and then enjoyed myself very much. And uh, I graduated in 1938, and uh, worked uh, part-time in a steel mill, working for the uh, uh, tel telephone country, the company. And uh, it was my job to uh, go out in the, the uh, I can't say field, but out in the uh, marketplace of the, where the steel was, the hot rolled steel, and deliver messages to different people. So the first time I think I was sent out in, the, in this place to uh, find a gentleman, I uh, was looking at all these steel sheets that were stacked together. And uh, all of a sudden, somebody gave me a kick in, in the butt. And he said, don't you dare touch any of those sheets. He said, you'll lose all of your fingers. So from that time on, I never cared to walk in the field so the, where all these hot sheets were, because it was, wasn't worthwhile losing any of my fingers. Right? But uh, uh, after that, I won a scholarship to the University of uh, Wisconsin. And this was 1939, I guess, 1940. And uh, we were 
the whole purpose was to develop television programs for children. And so uh, this was a very interesting couple of years I spent there. And then all of a sudden, uh, 1941 came around and the war was declared by our marvelous president. And uh, I had to decide at that time whether I'd wait for my number to be called because in those days, he, uh, I think there was a draft and they were drafting people for the army. So uh, rather than be drafted, I thought <coughs> I, I would enlist in the Navy, Air Force or, or the Navy. And uh, when I went back to Baltimore, I met a couple of my buddies and they all said, hey, we're going to join the Marines. Well, why don't you join with us? And I said, no, I think I like to fly. And they said, well, you never learned anything about flying when you were a kid. We were all together. We went to high school together. And said, we did nothing about planes. I said, oh, all right. So I joined the Marine Corps. And uh, naturally, I was sent to uh, the hell hole of the world, which is Paris Island, <laughs> South Carolina. And uh, that, that was where we went my boot cut tape uh, training. Paris Island, South Carolina. So you didn't wait to get drafted, you yes, enlisted. Yes, I, I enlisted, right. Uh, and we, I don't know how many weeks we spent in boot camp, but then we went to North Carolina, the rifle ranges, <clears throat> and after we went for the rifle range, we went right over to uh, San Diego, and we helped load ships and we learned to uh, climb up and down cargo nets. And we'd start, first of all, just with our blue jeans. And uh, then we'd put up one pack on, and then we'd put uh, fill the pack. And then we'd learn to put a rifle on and up and down these cargo nets. So we were fairly uh, able to uh, d disembark from a ship quite easily learning how to use the cargo nets. And after we loaded ship, then we went right over to the islands. And uh, so in the meantime, I had no uh, liberties at all. And we just worked and worked and worked. And uh, everything that we had to work with was from World War I. Uh, clothing and we had uh, rifles and the O3 rifle that had uh, five rounds to the uh, clip. So, and we were going to fight a war with a rifle with five bullets in it. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but we didn't know any different. This was a, it was a you know certain happy day because it was all so different for us. So, uh, so how when did you arrive in San Diego? Would that have been in 1942? Uh, 1942, yes, in San Diego, right. And when you said from there you went to the islands, so of the South Pacific, of right, course. Right, right. Uh, was that, how long were you in San Diego? A few months or? Uh, oh, no, just long enough to load ship. And uh, that, uh, that was it, right. And learn up to climb up and down on the cargo nets. And then we were gone, right. And I think it took us something like 14 days on board ship before we landed. And uh, uh, the first place we landed was uh, uh, <clears throat> American Samoa, I think it was. And uh, it took us 14 days to get there. Uh, and then uh, we practiced with our machine guns. And then after that, we went right over to Guadalcanal, right? Were you a machine gunner? I was a machine gunner, yeah. So you were with, as we would call it, a grunt unit, a, a combat infantry unit? Yes, right away, right. Okay. Right. All right. And how long did you stay in American Samoa? Oh, maybe uh, uh, a few weeks just to get practice. Of, uh, firing machine guns, learn how to do it, how to put them together, how to take them apart. And then we went right over to Guadalcanal. 
So the very first island you hit after American Samoa was Guadalcanal. Yeah, right. Tell us a little bit about that and what happened when you got uh, there. The day that we landed, uh, we had just, in, in those days, we had, a, we're, we went, had the cargo nets. We, the front of a ship never opened up, so we had to climb down the cargo nets. And then uh, after, and uh, then we entered the Higgins boats, of course, and then we landed, and uh, by the time we landed, the uh, Japanese Zeros were ready, and they were starting to uh, <laughs> shoot at us, so we had to disappear in a hurry. And uh, so we went back in the jungles r right away until they disappeared, and then we went to their bivouac area. So uh, we had to welcome them, for, I think, uh, there was a radio playing, as I remember, and I think it was uh, what we call her Rose, I think, by name. And she was playing songs for us and asked us if we liked our landing. <laughs> so we had a nice welcome. So, At this time, you were in the 1st Marine Division? Uh, I came in as a replacement to the 1st Marine Division, yeah. They, they needed uh, buddies, so... Uh, yeah, but then there was the 1st Marine Division, right. Mm -hmm. So when you landed at Guadalcanal, you were with the 1st Marine Division yes, at right. that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what kind of, once you got off the beaches, well, first of all, let me ask you about that. On the beaches, how was it, how was the amphibious assault? You had the zeros you just told me about. Uh, well, it was uh, pretty bumpy because they've, they've been, it's been bombed up and down, and... Uh, so they wanted to get us in the jungle as fast as they could, so uh, the, the pilots from when the Zeros couldn't find us, uh, naturally. So uh, we were in places that uh, were, were sort of cut out from the jungle, and, uh, and not always the best, but we did have, uh, uh, ended up with uh, mosquito netting, and uh, it didn't take us long, though, to find uh, uh, something to defeat the mosquitoes. The mosquitoes were just horrible. And we found these little, uh, I forget what they call the names, but they, uh, they liked to eat mosquitoes. And so we would capture these little buggers and take them and put them uh, in with us as we pulled the mosquito netting down and let them run around the, in, the, in their little tents and eat all the mosquitoes because uh, uh, the mosquitoes were like six inches long. They were just horrible. And uh, we found out that when we had to do duty at night that uh, we would put... Uh, Socks. We'd cut a hole in the in the toe so that the uh, bullet could come through the the rifle, and then we would pull the sock over our wrists and uh, cut a hole in, uh, at right around the heel, so that would be our trigger finger. So we were protected from mosquitoes, <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we we learned to do in a hurry. Right. So. So these creatures that you, these mosquito eating, I'm sorry I didn't know about in Vietnam, I would have gotten a few myself. Um, were they reptiles? Were they? Uh, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, they weren't reptiles. Uh, they, they, they were like big grasshoppers. Oh, I see. So they it was an insect of some they, kind. They looked big like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, but they were, they were wonderful. But after a couple of days, uh, the, the problem where we were, it rained three times a day, and you were always wet from either sweat or you were wet from water. And uh, so you'd do anything to, to, to cool off. So one night, uh, uh, I took off of my everything, and except my skimmies, and, uh, and I was sleeping very peacefully. And all of a sudden, something kept racing across my chest. Well, I didn't know if it was a snake or what. From So I slapped as hard as I could. And, of course, I killed my friend, my mosquito eater. 
<laughs> so I was unhappy for a couple of days. <laughs> So when you hit the beach, let me ask you a couple of questions. When you hit the beaches on your amphibious assault mm. uh, at Guadalcanal, I have two questions. First of all, when was it? What was the, do you remember the month and year that you landed at Guadalcanal? No, I really don't. I don't. It had to be 92, 90, 93. You mean 42? Yeah, I mean, yeah. 42, 42 43. 43, something like that. Um, what about the resistance? What kind of resistance did you meet on the beach from the ground troops? There, there was none, none whatsoever. Uh, when the first group hit Guadalcanal, nobody knew they were coming. And uh, in fact, they ran away because that's where they're building their airfield. And that's what they wanted, that airfield, because then they could control Australia and New Zealand. And then they think everything from their Tokyo all the way down the Pacific. So it was very important that they got uh, captured Guadalcanal. And I'm assuming it's also why it was important to the U.S. to keep them from getting that airfield. From effort. doing that, right. Okay. All right. So you, you said you got off the beaches, you went into the jungle to avoid the zeros. Yes. And, and to get right. cover. Um, did you then end up in contact with enemy soldiers at some point? Not right away, no. But then we learned to, go we never stayed in one place too long. We'd be moved around. So we could see, the fortunately, the Japanese were way at one end of the island and they had to come through the jungle. And if you're in the jungle, and you don't have a compass, you can be lost like in 15 minutes because it's so dense and so on. So that was really an advantage for us because they had to come through all the jungle, all the water, the mud, the dirt and everything, the rain. And uh, then we'd be waiting for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that we were really had the advantage, although we were... Uh, uh, we weren't as well prepared as they were because they could land anything they wanted to because all of our battleships you know, had been blown up at Pearl Harbor. And we had nobody to protect us, really. And we had to build that airfield as fast as we could so we could get some bombers so we could have some protection and some defense, right? Okay, so, but as you stayed there longer, did you came in contact with enemy forces at some point Oh, sure. Later. So tell us about that. Yes. Uh, well, let me say this. Uh, we weren't always under heavy fight, but the Japanese would prepare something. For example, uh, after we were there for a while, uh, the we Marines would trying to get our coffee clutches. And uh, this one time, uh, we were, uh, we decided that we, it was, everything was light, uh, light in combat at the time. And uh, I had decided in my own mind that there were no tomorrows because of what I was watching. And we sat around drinking coffee this one night and uh, wondering why the Japanese hadn't attacked so bad in, in the morning and the afternoon. And the fellows kept saying, oh, you know what I think? I'd like to go back and be a doctor. Or I, I'd like to home, go home and uh, go to college and maybe end up being a teacher. And somebody else would say, oh, no, I'm going out with the farmer because uh, I miss the farming. And then all of a sudden the, the alarm went off that uh, we were having an air raid. And then the, the, the alarm got louder and different, sort of a different beat. And then we said, aha, we're going to be bombed. So we ran down to our foxholes and, and got our ammunition all set. And then the bombers came, of course. And then in the morning, we had count off. And we'd go one, two, four, five, seven, eight, nine, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and we knew that if you didn't answer to a number, 
that there was no tomorrow. Mm. And uh, in the end, uh, what did we lose? A million? Uh, uh, not a million. A, a lot of a men. Thousand. We lost a thousand killed, killed and something like 1,400 very badly wounded, right? So On Guadalcanal. On Guadalcanal, right. So it was that sort of a come and going battle all the time. Yeah. So how long were you on the island of Guadalcanal? I guess I was there a couple of months, long Did, enough. Were you wounded on Guadalcanal? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we had no docks on Guadalcanal. The ship would pull in. The, one of the best entrances to the island that they could get and throw out their anchor and then they'd start unloading cargo. And they would unload it naturally with the big booms and, and everything was done in, in, in uh, big sacks. And they were what we, they, these nets that, that would be, have all the ammunition in it. So, and then we'd be in the water and we'd have to take whatever came out of the net and stack it in our little Higgins boat and make sure that we got everything balanced so we wouldn't <laughs> tip it over. And then uh, while we were doing this, uh, a couple of Jap planes came by and they, and they strafed the decks and so on. And unfortunately, they hit one of our nets and broke it. And the net opened immediately and ammunition fell out, and food fell out. And uh, here we were trying to <laughs> look up and watch all this ammunition coming over top of our head. And we had to dive out of the side of the, of the uh, boats, little, little Higgins boats. But fortunately, unfortunately, my foot got caught with one of the boats, uh, straps that held the, the, all the cargo together. And I twisted my leg very badly. And, uh, but I, I did break away. Uh, but it did get hit with some, somebody said they were, uh, uh, what did he say they were? Uh, Bangalore torpedoes. Of course, I'd never seen a Bangalore torpedo because everything we had was a World War I. Uh -huh. And uh, in those cargo nets, uh, I never saw one of these. Anyhow, I got hit by it. And then I had to dive in the, in the ocean and uh, swim around and, until... Uh, one of the, the cargo nets just opened up and fell right on top of everybody, and then we could hang onto that for a while until we could get it back in the ship. So uh, it, it was very difficult. We had different things that we had to do, not only just shoot the uh, Japanese, but uh, take care of ourselves the best way we possibly could. So it was not a nice place to be. <laughs> no. and, uh, I think uh, not. I never wanted to go back there, no. Uh -huh. Okay. So when so you stayed at Guadalcanal for a couple months. Yeah. During that time, how many times would you say you were involved in a ground attack with the Japanese? Oh, <clears throat> every day. Every day. Right, right, every day, right, yeah. So some were larger than others. Yes, amen, right, right. Because they wanted that, that uh, airfield. They were pretty fierce they, fighters, too. It took right? them six months. We fought, them, we fought them for six months for one island. When, during the period of months that you were there on Guadalcanal, did basically the Marines that were there, were you able to clear the island of Japanese forces while you oh, were there? No. Oh, no, because they could reinforce them all the time. We couldn't stop the reinforcements. I see. So, um, were you wounded on Guadalcanal? Yes, is right. that were, tell me about how you got wounded? Is that was, was that, that the that Bangalore was torpedo? That was the big thing, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so when when your unit and and by the way, I didn't ask you this earlier. You did tell me the first Marine Division, but do you remember your battalion and your company? What the designation was? No, I really don't. The only thing I know that uh, uh, later on we were a part of the third division, and. Uh, so I was part of the 3rd Division, attached, to, I guess, to the 1st Division, whatever it was. I see. Yes. I see. Um, because we went in just as, uh, well, how, uh, I, I guess just a couple hundred replacements at the time. Did you lose any friends at Guadalcanal? A uh, couple. Mm -hmm. People you'd gone through basic with or 
training in San Diego or? Oh, uh, none of those, no. <laughs> that, that was interesting. Uh, I was a, an expert rifleman, so when we were going, getting, lining up to get overseas, uh, we, we had a line up in, in, well, you know how you line up. Uh, and then we had to count off one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think it was. And every number went to a different group. And I had to end up, I think, with a number four. And all of a sudden, all number four is going to be machine gunners. So the people that I knew through boot camp, I weren't with any of them anymore. So you start another whole group of people. And then, uh, then you get to, in a battalion, and then you have another group of people. So right. It takes you a long time to get to know everybody. And yeah. then some of them get killed or wounded, and then they, they disappear. So you were a young single guy at this point, about 22 years old. Yes, right. Uh, did, you, did you have any other family members that were on active duty, brothers, oh, sisters? No. Well, I have no. no other brothers or sisters. So. Okay. Right. So when they pulled, when the Marines pulled you off of Guadalcanal, where did you go from there? I went to, uh, first of all, I went to the hospital, I think in some French Free, uh, free French uh, hospital. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the island it was, and uh, had surgery on my legs, and uh, then I was sent down to New Zealand. After that, and. Then had more surgery. That, no, I didn't have surgery in New Zealand. Just comp, uh, compensation. And then Bougainville. And then again back to... Uh, hmm. To another island for other surgery. And... Uh, Still relating to the, the yeah. leg injuries? Right. Uh, and then we went, I think we went back to New Zealand some time in there because I was uh, sent out a couple of times for, for, uh, for guard duty. And my legs didn't hold up, and so I'd be sent to. I got to another, another, another hospital island. And I, I can't remember. There were so many of them, and, and they, they had all French names. <laughs> so, so anyhow, I was in a lot of hospitals at the time, trying to recuperate. What were what were the surgical procedures you had to undergo due to this wounding? What what were they doing? To my neck, legs, you mean? Yeah. Well, I don't know exactly because uh, uh, the couple couple times they just did uh, uh, spinals, and uh, then somebody would hold your shoulders, and so you, but you still couldn't see what was going on. So I don't know what they did. So do the surgery, you'd heal up, and they send you back to yeah. the field again, and then you'd and, come back again. And yes, right, exactly. Right. Okay. Um, your trips to New Zealand, I think a lot of us have seen Band of Brothers and we kind of know about the liberties in New Zealand and, and um, some of the other islands. Um, is that with New Zealand trips to rearm and regroup? Is that what that was all about? Yeah, we were supposed to, yeah, retrain again right down there. Yeah, right. And you my dad And my legs would give out all the time. Yeah. So, yeah, so, right. So tell us about uh, Bougainville. Well, very, the very same thing as, as Guadalcanal. Just another great big island with all the jungle and uh, sloppy weather, of course, all the time. Rains three times a day and so on. How about enemy? Well, <laughs> it was the same type. That, that's what was uh, 
it was interesting. That's all they knew at that time, I guess, how to fight and how to uh, group together and, and so on. So, Were you involved in many contacts in Bougainville? Uh, no, not exactly. No, just uh, overhead fire a couple of times and uh, That, that was that wasn't as difficult as as uh, 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 Guadalcanal, right? That maybe because we were more accustomed to it. So, tell us about the weather. I think some of us have been in Southeast Asia. We kind of know what you're talking about. Tell for other people listening. Tell them about the weather. About the weather? Yes, sir. Well, when it would rain, it would it wouldn't be a nice rain. It'd be just pour, 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 and everything would be flooded. And uh, then, no matter where you go, uh, uh, it was swampy, and uh, it just wasn't cozy. <laughs> uh, it's it's some place you didn't want to be. Right? So. Hot in the daytime. Cold at night from sleeping in yeah, right, right. water. Right, right. It was horrible. That's all. How did you stay dry or did you stay dry? Oh, you didn't. No. No. We used to call it the monsoon. It would last about six months. And is that, that kind of what, mm -hmm. what we're talking about here? Yes, right. Where it rains horizontally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, uh, some of the natives told us what was coming. And uh, of course, the, Na the uh, Navy didn't know about it until two days before the monsoon came. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, so we had to batten down the hatches, as they say. So um, how long did you stay at Bougainville? Very short period of time. They got us out as, as soon as they can. They didn't, I think they wanted us to be sent someplace else. So, uh, uh, well, I think it was just a few weeks we were there, right? right. And did you, during a time... Oh, I know what it was. Yeah. That's, that's when I went back to the hospital again. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's why I was only there, I think, three or four weeks, right? And where was the hospital you went back to after Bougainville? New Caledonia. It's a French, it was a French island, I think, New Caledonia. More surgeries? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to interrupt you. I just want you to tell no, me, no, tell no. me a little bit about what the rest of the time you were with the Marine Corps. How long were you over in the South Pacific? Well, I guess I was up there a couple of years, back and forth, different islands, right? Mm -hmm. So, any other islands besides Bougainville and uh, Guadalcanal? Yeah, American Samoa, uh, Pango Pango. Don't ask me to spell it. <laughs> uh, I know it's got a G-O on it someplace. <laughs> <laughs> What about Iwo Jima? Did you make it to that one? Oh, no, 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 no. I was back in the States when, they, when the Iwo Jima came, right. So how many total surgeries would you say you had to have relating to the injuries? Oh, my legs? Yes. Uh, well, they told me that uh, I, I think I had two sets of surgeries, and they said before I died, I would three. I need three types of operations. They said, and they gave me some Spanish names, I think, or Latin names. Before you died. Yeah. Right. And so, have you had additional yeah. surgeries after World War Two? That's what they said. Yeah, I I'd always have them. Yeah. And did you have to have those additional surgeries? In fact, no. Uh, in fact. I'm down here at the VA hospital, the doctor said, I've given you all the pills I can to take care of your pain. And he said, if we put you on the table, he said, we'd have to drag you off. And he said, it isn't worth it. 
So yeah. you're not having okay. any more surgeries. <laughs> all right. right. <laughs> so. so first of all, if I might say, uh, I, I was stunned when it said you were born in 1920. Oh. You certainly look great. You don't you don't look okay. even remotely like you're yeah. 98 years old. So I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. Whatever there are you three things. People have been sending me books about how to live to be 100. So, uh, yeah. so I read these books. And I deducted uh, my own. I have three S's that the reason I'm, I think I'm as old as I am. First of all, there, uh, there are three S's, as I said. Uh, one is uh, sleep. You have to get a lot of sleep. That's good for you. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is a good scotch whiskey. <laughs> and drink as much as you can without getting drunk all the time. <laughs> and the third thing is lots of sex. <laughs> if you have those three S's, you're going to live for Tim Hale, an old man. I'll, uh, I'm going to write this down and show it to my wife tonight when I get home. <laughs> um, so, uh, so tell me, how long totally were you in the Marine Corps? How many? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. And of that three and a half years, most of your time was spent in the South Pacific. Oh, correct? sure, sure. When did you actually deploy back to the United States? It must have been forty-five. Um, was, oh, I, have, I have to tell you about that. Uh, yeah, please. I, I came back on a hospital ship, and uh, we were about a, a half an hour out of San Francisco. Of course, we've been dodging, dodging submarines all the time. But uh, we, uh, I forgot how long it took us, a long time. But we were about a half hour out of the San Francisco, and the captain now announced that... Uh, uh, if you wanted to, we'll be going on the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, as soon as he said that, anybody had a cast or a crutch or a cane, they'd rat up topside. So we were all up there waiting to go under the Golden Gate Bridge, and finally the captain says, here we go, and he honked his horn, and under we went. And I looked up and I said, oh, thank you, Father, for bringing us all home. Right? And to that Amen. day, I think that's one of my best uh, memories of my yeah. life, uh, going under that Golden Gate Bridge. Right? So when you came uh, back in 45 mm -hmm. on the hospital ship, yeah. was the war still going on in the Pacific? Sure. It was. Mm -hmm. So this was before Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And uh, where did you process out of the Marine Corps? What base, do you remember? Yes. Uh, I was in uh, several hospitals in California, and uh, there was a colonel in the hospital with us this time. He said, Harry, he said, uh, you were in Guadalcanal, and he said, Bougainville, he said, you got to go to Quantico. And I said, well, I don't think I'm going to be able to stand up. And he says, you're going to Quantico. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> so I, they enrolled me <laughs> in Quantico. <laughs> Well, I don't know how many weeks I was there, and I, had, I went to the chaplain, and, and, and uh, he said, uh, I'm going to send you to the doctor. So he sent me to the doctor, and he gave me an examination. He looked at my report, and he said, uh, we don't want any hippies running around as officers in the Marine Corps. He says, you're going to be discharged. <laughs> so I was discharged from Quantico. That was in... Uh, when, uh, 1945, right. Okay. And uh, so uh, I was discharged in August, and September I got married to this gal. Oh, I guess I got to tell you about uh, in San Diego. Uh, I was in the hospital in San Diego, and uh, of course, you're in the hospital, you don't have any money, nobody knows anything about anybody. And, uh, so I had to borrow, borrow a dime, I think, in, to, on the telephone, because in those days you had to have money to make a phone call. So I got a, the operator, and I said, Operator, I want Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, she said, uh, it's, it's going to cost you so much money. I said, well, I don't have it. I said, but you can get it on the other side. And I said, they don't <laughs> have the money. So sure enough, she rang the Milwaukee, and the lady answered the phone. And uh, she said, uh, Marjorie, there's some guy in San Diego in the hospital. He wants to talk to you. You want to talk to him? His name is Harry. And so, oh, of course. And then 
I heard them on the phone running around trying to get money, dimes and quarters to put in the phone book so, so they could call. So anyhow, we got enough money and I talked to her. And I said, honey, I said, as soon as I'm discharged, I said, uh, well, we're going to get married. I said, please don't, don't, don't run around with too many guys. And so after I was discharged, we were married. And uh, I was in, that was all September. We got married, right? Well, now, how long had you known Marjorie at that point? I had known her before the war. Before I, the war. She was in the same class with me when we were I trying see. to get uh, TV yeah. work together for, uh, I see. for kids, right? So, so anyhow, then uh, uh, I think I was, we were married for four months. I was, went to Northwestern. And uh, the one morning, I guess I threw up a lot of blood. And she said, you're going to the doctors. And we went to the doctor and he said, he examined me and he said, uh, are you a veteran? I said, yes. He said, you're going right to the VA hospital. So they sent me to the, well, I mean, he, had his, <laughs> he had a friend of his drive me, Marjorie and I, to the hospital and they accepted me. And then about two weeks later, after they gave me a lot of x-rays and things, uh, uh, this doctor called and uh, said, Mrs. Cohn, uh, I have to talk to you and your husband. He said, uh, You're, he's not going to make it. And he said, you better start looking for another boy. And uh, I grabbed my wife's wrist and I said, uh, honey, don't listen to him. I'm going to make it. <laughs> So I'm sure he's passed on at this point, yeah, oh, and sure. you're here with us. If you believe what in miracles, it? what was the diagnosis? Yeah, uh, they didn't tell us. They didn't tell us at the time. But later on, I found it. I had I picked up TB when I was in service, yeah. and this was uh, and then finally they showed me the X-ray, and I had a huge hole like this in my lung, and they said they they could never close it. So. Mm. Anyhow, I'm here. You're here. <laughs> so you seem to have come through that yeah, uh, dodge right. that so, bullet very so I, well. I, I feel like I'm a miracle kid, right? So, so you and Marjorie got married right after you got out of the Marine Corps. Yeah. And how many uh, children do you have? We I, we, we developed three kids: two I girls see. and uh, uh, see. and a, and a boy. And one of them's here with and us today. That's, yeah, that's Susie. She's the oldest, right? Okay. Is she still here? I believe I she is. I thought she would leave. Yeah, she, <laughs> I believe she is. Yeah. Um, I know she doesn't want to listen, right? No, I think she's listening very intently. I oh, think you're wrong. Nice uh, and your other two children, where where are they today? Uh, Barbara, uh, she's been dead now for about oh, four sorry. years. Yeah. And uh, my son, he's still running around selling uh, stuff to banks. And... Uh, so he's happy, and we're going to have lunch tomorrow. Do you have so. grandchildren? Uh, I have five grandsons, yes, right. No, okay. four, four grandsons and one granddaughter. Great granddaughter, right. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Very nice. So when you came out of the Marine Corps, you and Marjorie got married. They told you you weren't going to make it to the doctor uh, at the VA Medical Center. Um, what did you then do in civilian life after you well, got out of the Marine Corps? Me, he, they said, uh, I was there for two and a half years. So it took them that long to, do, to fix me up. You were in the VA Medical Center two and a half years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Relating to the tuberculosis. I was a bed patient for 11 months. And wow. uh, then they started giving me all sorts of stuff. and. Uh, this is this is before they got medicine for TB. And, yeah, and uh, so then they brought in a special doctor uh, for TB, I guess, and he decided to give me a phrenic crush. So I've been running around with one lung, paralyzed, and uh, then I had the pneumoperitoneum. And that pushed the other lung up. And uh, by doing that, it, they closed it. So, apparently. A miracle. Yeah. So. So what, after you got out of the hospital, what did you do in oh, civilian they life? They said, uh, uh, d don't do anything vegetative, just do things sedentative. So, 
They said, why don't you try to teach it? So I said, okay. So I went to Northwestern. And fortunately, they paid for everything. They, they were marvelous, the government. Uh, I feel so sorry for guys today when they can't get you know, money yeah. for education. I don't think I ever saw one bill. <laughs> they just paid for books, pencils, pens, anything I needed. They paid for it. And uh, so then uh, I finished that. Got, I got my degree, my BS. Then they wanted me to stay for a master's, and I stayed for my master's. And uh, then they wanted to stay for my PhD. And I said, no, I got two kids. I need money. <laughs> <laughs> I have to live. So then I taught. Uh, I taught elementary school, taught el high school, and finally to co to college. So I've had a wonderful life. And how many years did you teach? Oh, about 40 years, I guess. Long enough to, to mm -hmm. say enough's enough? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then I retired, right? So how long have you been retired um, now at this point? You know, I don't know. Uh, so we moved here in uh, 20, 20, 30, 40, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. Uh, honey, when did we move here? About 25 years ago. 95? No, your, your daughter said 25 years ago, so that would make it yeah. about right. 1995. Does Something that sound like about that, right? Yeah, right? Something like mm -hmm. that? Okay. Um, and it sounds like you're enjoying your retirement. Oh, every bit of it, every bit of it, right. Just wonderful. So are there other things you would like to tell us either about your Marine Corps service or just about things in general, just about life in general, lessons you've learned or whatever? Well, uh, I learned it. <laughs> Uh, I was teaching night school, and uh, I was teaching a course of, well, I forget the, not what the course was now, but uh, it was for the city of, of uh, Chicago. And uh, it, was, it was a night class. And this one fellow lived in, a, he was a supervisor for some, something in the city of Chicago. And he lived in the suburbs, and he had to take a train at night to go home. So... Uh, in those days, I could drive, so I would drive to the station. Well, this one night, we were waiting for we were waiting. Some the train was late coming or leaving or something, and we were sitting in the car talking, and uh, somebody rapped on the window, and uh, had a gun, and he and I looked at him, and I looked at the fellow sitting next to him, and I. I said, don't move, and we'll talk to this guy and see what. And I said, what do you want? And he said, I want your money. And I said, well, just a minute, I have to get out of the car. And when I talked to this fellow, I said, now, as soon as I get around the back, you try to open the door, because if we could get this far with him, we got him. <laughs> <laughs> so I came around the back, and I told him, I said, all right, here, look in my pocket. And by that time, this fellow opened the door, and then, of course, he dropped the pistol, and uh, we had him right there. So, good But I learned you. that in the Marine Corps. I was going to say, it sounds yeah. like a good Marine tactic yeah. to me, yeah. Right. Have your cover guy right. got your back. Right. Um, what, tell me what you think just to the world, I mean, and your family. Uh, what do you think you learned out of the Marine Corps? I, I think you'll learn to take care of yourself. And, and from what we saw and what we did, uh, it, it's just amazing. Uh, it's so, it makes you so proud to be an American, really. Uh, uh, And we, we know that everybody has a mind, and we know that God gave them a mind, and that they would just use it. I mean, from the body, from, from the neck down, everybody's the same. Heart, lung, feet, 
nose, the lungs, or stuff. But from here up, the, the, it's the brain that that makes us all different. And if we could just reach something, some way. Uh, obviously, the churches aren't doing it, and uh, history hasn't helped us. But I don't think we're ever going to be one because of our minds. I think this is what I've learned, that we're always going to be different. But we have to find some way that we can say, yes, uh, I do not appreciate some of the things you're doing, but you're, you're entitled to do it, and I still like you. And uh, we get along, because there, there's the four of us. One is, one fellow, we learn, I just learned this from, from our church, one fellow is uh, 60, he's 63. Another fellow is 72, another fellow is 85, and here I am, 98, and we all get along, but we disagree. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, we argue all the time about something, right? But, but we enjoy each other. We have dinner every uh, we have dinner every Friday. We have breakfast every Monday, and uh, we watch movies. Uh, how religion was developed in India and China and uh, different other places in the world. And uh, we, we watched 52 uh, uh, shots, not shots, uh, rolls of uh, uh, Buddhism and why Hindus are what they are and so on. And, and we talk about this and discuss it. And why can't one religion unite everybody? And and it's because of our minds, I don't think we can. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we could just find some key, and by that, I don't think any one person is going to do it. I mean, Christ tried to do it, but that was 2,000 years ago. And it, it, did it work? Well, then you have this yes or no. And uh, why it did, why it didn't. And so... And, and we do that, so that's help, helps me to stay alive and old, kind of awake, right? So then, based on what you just said, how do you view today's political, governmental structure? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, I just hope we don't lose everything. <laughs> I just hope he get, doesn't get assassinated or something like that, yeah. you know, because uh, he's so uh, individual that. Uh, and it doesn't work, but he won't listen to anybody. So yeah. uh, you can't trust him. And, and I don't know how I ever got to it. I didn't vote for him any other period for, okay. for that one reason, right? I, understand. I didn't want to turn this into yeah, political right. discussion. Yeah. But <laughs> looking back over the last 98 years, do you have any regrets? Anything you wish you'd done, done more of, done less of, whatever? Uh, uh, no. Uh, uh, maybe my mind isn't uh, there. It, uh, uh, nothing that made me want to do this or that or something. Uh, uh, I think I was so happy to survive the Marine Corps for one thing, you know, and uh, for what I saw, and uh, uh, it was so dreadful and so on. Uh, uh, so I just happened to be alive, you know. And, had a wonderful wife <coughs> and fabulous kids. So, well, then you're a lucky man. Oh, absolutely, you're a lucky absolutely, man. Right. Well, we're proud of your service, and we thank you for your service. Well, and, thank you for uh, your service. Too. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you're very proud of what you did, as yeah. you should be. Right. Well, <laughs> one thing that just happened, I thought was very cute, and I mentioned to Sue over here. Uh, here I am, 98, and the war was way back in 1942, was it? 42, 44, 45, something. And I just got a, some uh, badges from them. <laughs> yeah. Badge of metal. I saw, yeah, I yeah, saw yeah. that, yeah. Did you get some too? No, I saw uh, your daughter was showing me on the table that you had, that the Marine Corps sent you some things. They're only about uh, what... Uh, 
how many years late here? Yeah, Let's see. Yeah, yeah. 55, uh, 73 yeah, years yeah, late. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. Right. So well, better we, late than never. Yeah, better late than never. But right. so, yeah, if you're dead, what good is the <laughs> medals right. coming? Well, you're dead. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. So, yeah. so, well, I, I want to also mention, uh, I, I didn't say this when we started, but um, our videographer today is Sue Verhoff, who's with the Atlanta History Center. And she certainly uh, got all this set up, so I can sit here and just ask questions. Kurt Mueller did the recording. Um, he wrote down the key things that mm. you talked about today. So there will be both your video record and a written record of oh. some of the mm. high points, uh, if you okay. will. Not that anything was anything other than a high point. Um, and this interview will, will in fact, be um, placed on the Atlanta History Center site oh sometime within the next six to 12 months, I guess. Hmm. Uh, we have quite a number of interviews that are there. Um, and it will also go to the Library of Congress so that it, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren will be able to access yeah. your video and you will get a copy of it oh my, after oh today. My. So, uh, in behalf of all of us from the Atlanta History Center and, and the uh, Legacy Project, I want to thank you for sitting for the interview today. Oh, uh, I well. thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you well, uh, for allowing me so. to. Uh, yeah. And um, and I want to ask you before we close down here: Is there anything else that you want to tell us about that we haven't covered, or something you'd like to offer? Just in general. Well, I'll think of something after you're gone, naturally. <laughs> okay. Well, you can call me at home tonight and tell me, but it won't go on the interview. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Well, All right. Not, well, no, not. not. I, and now I'm going to ask Sue and Kurt if they have any questions now, sir. I do have a couple of questions, if oh, that's God. okay. Um, what do you remember about hearing about Pearl Harbor? You, you know, what? do you remember where you were and what you were doing when you heard that? Yes, I was in Milwaukee when it, when Pearl Harbor occurred. It was a Sunday, and uh, I think we were all having lunch uh, when we got the news. And uh, there must have been 15 of us around the table having lunch. I lived in a boarding house while I was at North, uh, not at Northwestern, but in the University of Wisconsin. And I lived in this boarding house, and there were about 18 of us that lived there. A huge mansion up in Milwaukee, and uh, we were all shocked. We we did. I th I don't think we actually knew where a Pearl Harbor was, except that's where the battleships were. Like, we knew that, but uh, yeah, we we were just. Overwhelmed, right. Is there anything that you can tell us that you remember about the crossing, crossing the Pacific when you first went to Guadalcanal? Anything you remember about that trip? Oh, yeah. Uh, first of all, we didn't know where we were going, of course. You know, we were just just goofy people. Just, uh, I remember the ocean was so gorgeous. I, I never got seasick at any time, and I went through a monsoon once. Uh, uh, I remember the ocean, and uh, I remember the color. It was sort of a green. I, I thought, gee, I think Margie would have a, if she had a green dress, that looked like this. It would be beautiful. Uh, but no, we weren't attacked on the way to Dover. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, uh, I remember, uh, no, no, that, that, that's not where we're going. We were going to one of the islands and uh, we had a, like a monsoon and uh, we had to tie ourselves to the mounts and uh, <laughs> Yeah, the Navy guys tied us up to guns, right? Uh, <laughs> so we wouldn't be washed overboard. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And you mentioned that the native people told you when the weather was coming. What kind of contact did you have with the local people on those islands? Oh, 
this we were on uh, one of the American Samoas, I think, at the time, and uh, we wanted we we didn't have any uh, <coughs> sticks to hold up the cargo nets, so we thought we could go out in the jungle and uh, get some cargo nets. So we did. And we got some, we came back with our bayonets and we sharpened, the, I mean, cut off the, what we didn't need. And so we had wonderful nets for our, I mean, sticks for our car, for our uh, nets. For, and then, of course, the talking chief came. And we were ostracized because we didn't ask if we could do this. And nobody would talk to us. And where, where we had our huts, we, we had got the natives, I guess, said you can use these huts. Uh, they were wonderful, had nice floors on them, on, uh, coral floors and the mats on top of the coral and that sort of thing. Nobody would come near us. They wouldn't talk to us. And if they'd see us coming, they had uh, uh, bamboo uh, logs put out, and you have to cross the different streams and cross different waterways. And uh, if if you were starting to walk and somebody's even in the middle, they'd turn around and walk back. So finally, we all apologized to the talking chief and then he talked to his people, and then they, they invited us. And we went to a Siva Siva. And this is when they catch the different fish. Uh, uh, the first time I saw it, I, I didn't approve of it, <laughs> but they, they loved to do it. They'd take the fish and push their finger through the fish's eye and, <laughs> and suck the juice out of the, where the eye was. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Anyhow, they liked that, and they'd have the tar reef, and then they had the coconut. They would, when you get, you, know, you have to sh take the thin off the coconut, and then you have the ball. And then on top of the ball, there are three little nipples, and you have to poke those out. And apparently that's where they put all the, the juices, or not the juices, but the fruit or vegetables, whatever it is, they want to make the booze out of it. <laughs> and so they would have the Siva Siva and then we'd have we'd drink some of their juice. And it wasn't too bad. So <laughs> Not quite but that was their, that was not their quite Siva a good, Siva, yeah. Not quite Fish. a and what else would they have? Oh bananas <sighs> and uh, oh if you wanted anything, you just have to ask the talking chief. And he would talk to somebody, and if they bring you bananas or they bring you coconuts or whatever it is that you wanted, right? It was really neat. So, hmm. do you remember where you were when you heard that the war was over, that Hiroshima had happened? Hmm. I don't know if I was in, in Quantico or not. No, I, I wasn't in Quantico. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. One last question. Um, it sounds like the injuries that you sustained have really followed you all your life. Yes, they have. What was the nature of the, was it the torpedo, was it shrapnel that had, that had cut tendons and things? What happened to your legs in that it was, it was the being hit by the, uh, whatever came out of the cargo now. Okay. Right. Okay. Did they explode? No, it didn't explode. No. So it was just the weight of everything that fell out everything of the cargo. Was, yeah, it was in it was in the uh, forms. So a crushing injury, yeah, really, right. more than mm -hmm. okay. Wow. And then the fact that I twisted it so badly, yeah. and, and everything, so they cracked and and muscles pulled and all sorts of stuff, right? Yeah. So, wow. So I mean, I can't tell you because the doctors don't talk to you when you they do that. They cut on you. And, want you to get up and walk out. So. You mentioned a story before we started the camera yeah. of a fellow I wish I had with. put that in there, but uh, yeah, I forgot. So tell us about him. Uh, I forget which hospital I was in, but the Navy had just 
won a, a battle with the Japanese in, in the water, in a naval battle, right. And uh, that was just, by, just about the time of Guadalcanal or a little before there. And uh, I had a bed next to this one fellow, Navy guy. And uh, he always used to wear a, a picture around his neck. And I said, George, I said, don't you get tired of wearing that picture? And he said, oh, no. He said, it's a picture of my brother. I said, well, why are you wearing that? He said, well, he was the best looking guy in the family. And I said, well, so what? Well, half of his face was done and it looked really nice. The other half was sort of green and yellow and, and really pulled apart. And then he, on his leg, they were taking uh, skin and they rolled up like a pencil. And it, they, then they grow it up a little further in the skin. Then they put it on their ribs and they grow up to their shoulders. And then they get it up here and then they're ready to work on his face, right? So he said, I want the doctors to look at this and get to know this face. He said, when they make the, my other side of the face, he said, it's going to look like this picture. Oh. Uh, I thought, gee, that, wow. that, that's beautiful. You know, That's was, a great yeah. story. Yeah. I wish I had put it on there. Well, you just you did. did. You, did. <laughs> you just did. We didn't stop the camera. No, we're oh. still going. Oh, it's there. We're still going. Oh. Yeah. I to make and sure thank we got you that for on. remembering it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great story. Well, then there's. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's. Uh... No, we didn't have any females. So we were. <sighs> yeah. The natives were pretty clever. They kept up. Well, we didn't have time. We were just. Too busy. They, we were always busy. Oh, that—that that was the trouble. The only time I think we were relaxing was when we were in New Zealand. That was very nice. And they're poor people. Uh, we felt sorry for them. All oh, their guys were over in Tobruk. Yeah. Yeah. And the same thing with Australia. You know, so it's, it's very uh -huh. important that we stop them at Guadalcanal yeah. because then they can't get to New Zealand or Australia. Right. So. Uh, so, so uh, well, Canal was very important, right? Very. Yeah. Kurt? I do have one question for you. Sure. Describe the Japanese soldier that you faced in combat. <sighs> oh, they, they were told what to do, and then they would do it, period. Try to do it. Whether it was to kill you with a knife or a bayonet or rifle or whatever it was, right. And they always, need, it seemed like they always needed somebody to tell them what to do. And uh, that was one of the, if they said stop, they'd stop, if they said go, go, you know. They, they didn't have the uh, acumen that, that the Americans had. That was one of our advantages. You know. that's, it's interesting because that's the same thing my father said. Hmm. They. Um, Mm -hmm. They did. They were not trained. That they were clearly. And you, I, I guess what you're saying is, they were not mm -hmm. disciplined enough, nor had the all to assume leadership uh, roles. Where in the, our services, if you somebody got hurt, mm -hmm. you would take the next person's position. Right. And you could move into a leadership role. Right. And my yeah. understanding, the Japanese were not trained to do that. Everything oh. that was given commands came from their officers yeah, and true, if the officer right. got killed they were disarrayed. Is that right. Correct? Right. Did you find that situation in combat? Did you see them where they were in, in Well, in the jungle it's different. You're not you're you're not all together, you know, you're separate. Somebody's behind a leaf, somebody's up in the tree, right, right. somebody's someplace else, right? Right. But uh they're, they're, they don't think for themselves because they're not taught to think for themselves, mm -hmm. right? Or if they are, they're going to get shot by their officers because they're not supposed to do anything unless they're told what to do. Well, it sounds very much like the Viet Cong in, in Vietnam. Oh. They, if they got separated from the unit, they only knew they were supposed to go from point A hmm. to point B. They couldn't have... No. taken over, couldn't have told you the mission, no. wouldn't have done anything without an officer telling him what to do. So no. maybe it's an Asian 
a culture kind of thing. I don't know. Hmm. Anything else, Kurt? Sue? Okay. Well, this will conclude our interview. It's December 19th, 2018. Oh. And we are concluding our interview of Harry J. Cohn. And well, thank, well, thank sir, you. thank you very much. Okay. Thank I'm, you. I'm sorry I stumbled here and there. No, no you didn't stumble at all. Perfect. You were perfect. Well, perfect. But the submarine? Yeah, well, I guess that's the one. Is that the one? Must be. Because you were out there all by yourself, right? Tell us about it. Oh, no, I wasn't by myself. Uh, we were on an island. Hmm. And what can I say? It was like a U. And we were way out of here on this point. We had a machine gun dug in in the dirt, and uh, every night three of us would go out there. One, two with a machine gun, and one bar man, B A R. You know what? You know what the B A R. I did Browning. Yeah. Automatic, automatic rifle. Yeah. Right. And so there'd be three of us, and we were supposed to watch if anything was in the, in the ocean, and so naturally, I was one of the guys. And uh, we were, it was our time, we ate something very early, and we walk across the car. Well, as we walk across the car, the Cardinal Reef, there were these beautiful buttons, the uh, shells, and we used to stop and pick them up. And I, in a way, I got a whole bag full of them, and I gave them to a CB to, to cut down a bayonet for me. And uh, of course, all the stuff you lose when you go to a hospital. But anyhow, uh, we were out here, and all of a sudden, uh, we see this thing coming up out of the ocean. <laughs> and before we know it, we recognize it's a submarine. And then before we know it, they start unloading. Well, we, I, I fire the machine gun right away. And uh, that wakes up the people on our island, it's down here in this part of it, right? And then, fortunately, we I we didn't know it, but up in here the the uh, army or or the navy I guess couldn't be the navy. Navy doesn't have guns like that, do they? Uh, must have been the army. No, no Marine Corps. What's what am I thinking of? A friend of mine was one of them. Uh, they, they opened it with I think they had seventy fives or some big artillery artillery like this, right? And as and fortunately we in the Marines. Uh, had a load uh, bayonets, not, not bayonets, uh, bandoliers for our machine gun. And we had red, black, and yellow. And red was, was what, fire? And black was brass? And yellow rain. was tracers. Yeah, yeah, right, the tracers. Well, we didn't know at the time. We just kept loading up our belt, right? So when we fired, <laughs> there was this nice yellow line going from where we were right to the submarine. <laughs> we didn't know at the time. They loaded the well, wrong we belt. Know, you know, yeah. We never had a bag of ammunition before in our lives. <laughs> so fortunately, I, I'm sure that the guys in the gun could do that we had the mathematics, make the angle, and then they knew exactly where to fire. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they opened up one there. And before we knew it, those guys were back in that submarine, and they were gone. <laughs> <laughs> but that was my first combat experience, right, if that was combat. But that was funny. And he looked at me like them. I said, do you know they knew where we were? <laughs> he said, oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... It's so I believe we've life. got your Marine Corps uniform here. I believe oh. you were PFC. Yes. Okay. Let me turn the camera off for just a sec. All right. Okay. Okay, Harry, tell us about this uniform. Tell us about your uniform. These are dress dress blues, right? Yes. Okay. I never got them. No? No. <laughs> never got them. Yeah, my, my family bought these for me. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Because every time you go someplace, you lose your uniform. Right. And you don't get the same uniform back again. You don't get anything <laughs> back again, right? And you have to go to the storeroom and 
<laughs> so I, I never had, I had a set of greens and khakis, and that was all. So, Well, Harry, I will we tell you, that, in, that has improved. It has. Now right? when they take away your uniform, they're waiting there with another uniform so, so you can't escape. They oh give you another gosh. uniform immediately. Oh so gosh, yeah. today you would get your dress blues back. So can you tell us a little bit about the no, colors can't. you've got on there? You've got some decorations oh, on there. What uh, are those? What is, oh, uh, I don't know <laughs> what they are. Uh, these are, one, one, this is for rifle, and one's for bayonet, one's for uh, hand grenade, and uh, what's this one? I don't know. I don't know. They're, they're just things you pick up as you go along. Well, what's the purple one over there? I know you know what that uh -huh. is. Yeah, that's a purple heart, right? Okay. And this, I think, is for the Pacific and... Uh, Uh, oh, yeah, and this is for uh, Guadalcanal. Okay. Because there's a star on it, right? Uh, yeah. Awesome. Doesn't one of them relate to the World War II victory? Yeah. Yeah, I guess Not, so. Yeah, I believe it does. Yeah. And is the, is the maroon with the blue stripe down the middle, is that the Good Conduct Medal? Or, or no, I didn't get that? one of those. You didn't have good conduct. <laughs> I never got any conduct, by the way. Until you're drinking too many coconuts. Yes, then. Was right. that what happened? Yeah, too many coconuts, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Susan, so the family bought it for me, right? That's so, wonderful. And you're only supposed to wear it on high days and holidays or something, right? So Unless you're in the Marines, right? And not being in the Marines, you're not supposed to... So anyhow, it's beautiful. kids, mm -hmm. they're going to bury me in this, though, yep. I guess. Yes, we told them to bury me. Anyhow, I was proud to be a Marine. Right, right. And you should be. Is there anything else you wanted to do on Canada Publishing? Uh, Daddy, your philosophy of life about every day. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that came across on the camera. Did it? No. As far as your daughter, Sue, no. said, what is your philosophy about everyday life? Tell us. There ain't, there ain't no tomorrow? Is that what you mean? I don't know. And then every day, every day is a holiday? Oh, yeah. Every day for me is a holiday. <laughs> 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 yeah. so, you might as well enjoy it because uh, otherwise you're unhappy. And uh, I guess I learned that from being in the, in the hospitals for so long. Oh, the, uh, where was it? Uh, we used to get planters peanuts and the big, you know, how they come in the can, but there were no peanuts in there. There'd always be cigarettes. So we used to take them out, you know, put them on a, on a machine gun and say, now you can shoot it off. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, uh, uh, this was in the VA hospital, though, this happened. Uh, there was a fellow next to me and I was here and there was a window over here right next to him. And this was a big ward, and this was in Chicago. And where was it in Chicago, honey? The, the VA hospital. What's the name of it? Where'd she go? Oh, she's here. She's thinking. I'm, I'm, oh. I'm just trying to think of it. What, what can you think of it? Heinz. 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 Yeah, Heinz VA hospital. Right. And uh, it, a big ward. And. Uh, I don't know what all, different people were in it, but the doctor came through and he said uh, people were smoking cigars, pipes, cigarettes, and he looked at around the room. He says, I hope all you bastards die. He said, you're smoking. You're all going to die. And then he walked out. So I think it was the next day, the, uh, my, the fellow was here. He said, Harry, you mind if I close the window? He said, I'm in a little chilly. And I said, no, go ahead. So he closed the window. He got and walked over to get in his bed, fell down on his knees, put his hands on the bed, vomited blood, and oh. died right in front of me. I haven't had a cigarette since 1949. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll make you a believer right there. Yeah, yeah. So. Wow. So. Is that the one you mean, dear? Every day's a holiday. Every day's, Every a, day's holiday. a holiday. Right. 
So. Wow. Yeah. Well, excellent. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, well, my pleasure. Thank you for coming.